So this video will be covering chapter 7, section 2, which is oxidation numbers, also sometimes known as oxidation states. Now oxidation numbers are numbers assigned to atoms within compounds to uh, clarify like electron location within the compound. So they're very similar to the charges on different ions in an ionic compound. So for example, if we have NaCl, which has a one positive charge, and a one negative charge on the cation uh, sodium and the anion chlorine. These numbers, which are the ionic charge, so they're not oxidation numbers, but they're analogous to oxidation numbers which occur in uh, non-ionic compounds. Now these oxidation numbers are not an inherent chemical property like uh, charges on ions in ionic compounds. They're sort of rounded numbers, however they help for uh, figuring out how different atoms bond within compounds and uh, solving various chemical uh, formulas and reactions. So there are some general rules for assigning oxidation numbers to various atoms within a compound. And just for the purpose of assigning these oxidation numbers, uh, we'll assume that the more electronegative element, that is the element with a higher electronegativity, uh, will just take the electrons in a shared pair like this. So for example, if we had CO2 in which oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 and carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, rather than saying that an electron pair is shared between carbon and each oxygen, we would just say that the oxygen uh, takes those electrons from the carbon because it is more likely to have them since it has a higher electronegativity. So when calculating oxidation numbers, we treat electrons, even within molecular compounds, as if they're transferred to the more electronegative element, much like the behavior in actual ionic compounds. Now because there's a close analogy between uh, oxidation numbers and ionic charge, for the most part you can use uh, ionic charge, if you'll remember it goes plus one, plus two, plus three, minus three, minus two, minus one. You can use these charges to find the uh, oxidation number for elements within this group. However, there are exceptions. For example, if you have a pure element, like let's say O2 or P4 or S8, you can't use just the oxidation number from the group because the oxidation number has to add up to zero. Again, it can be thought of as an ionic charge. So if you had an oxidation number, let's say you used oxygen's negative two, and you had two atoms at negative two essentially charge, you'd end up with an atom that was negative four. However, we know that neutral uh, oxygen does not have a negative four uh, charge on it, so you have to arbitrarily assign uh, molecules that contain only one element. Each element within that gets a number of zero so that you can add up all the charges on each atom, which would be zero, two times, four times, eight times, etc., and get a neutral molecule. Now there are, of course, more exceptions to this uh, ionic oxidation number analogy. For example, fluorine always gets the number negative one no matter what because it is the most electronegative element. It has an electronegativity of four and all the others are scaled off that. Oxygen also, though it will usually have an oxidation number of negative two because it's in group uh, 16, when it forms compounds where it has more than one oxygen, for example, hydrogen peroxide, it will be given an oxidation number of negative one. And this is so that it can balance out the positive one from, say, the hydrogen. In this case, there'd be two positives coming from the hydrogen. And then if you assigned it to the value of negative two, you would end up with a molecule that has a negative two charge on it, which we know again from experimentation that hydrogen peroxide is a neutral molecule. Therefore, the oxidation number has to be halved to be negative one. And a few very electronegative elements like oxygen 
have to change their behavior when they're partnered with fluorine, for example, in the molecule OF2. Because fluorine always has the value of negative 1 for its oxidation number, it has a total charge of negative 2, which means the oxygen actually has to have a positive charge in this case. Because even though it's one of the most electronegative elements, when it's put with the most electronegative element, it has to give up its electrons, essentially, to come up with a neutral atom, or a neutral molecule, rather, with zero charge. Oxygen isn't the only exception, however. Hydrogen, for example, has an oxidation number of positive 1, as you'd expect, because it's in group 1 most of the time. However, when it's put with things that are less electronegative than it, such as uh, many of the metals, it takes, oxen takes on an oxidation number of negative 1, because again, when it's more electronegative, it will tend to take the electrons and therefore gain the negative charge. Now, as I mentioned previously, the oxidation numbers for a neutral atom have to add up to zero. So, for example, if we take water, hydrogen, as I already mentioned, has an oxidation number of positive 1. So we'll put that right there. And oxygen, because it's in group 16, as an oxidation number of negative 2 most of the time. In this case, it does. So, if you take the two hydrogens, each with an oxidation number of positive 1 apiece, you end up with positive 2 plus the oxidation number of just the sole oxygen, negative 2, and you end up with a neutral atom. However, polyatomic ions are not neutral. They end up with some sort of positive or negative charge once you've uh, combined them. So let's take an example of a polyatomic ion. Let's say hydroxide, which is OH minus, that is minus 1. If we again look at the oxidation numbers for its components, you'll see that oxygen has an oxidation number of negative 2, and hydrogen has an oxidation number of positive 1. Now, if we add them together, the negative 2 plus 1 equals negative 1, which is the charge on the polyatomic ion. So for most compounds, which tend to be neutral atoms, like water, the oxidation number has to be 0, and has to total up to 0 based on the component atoms. However, in polyatomic ions, where there's a total charge on the collection of atoms, what happens is the total oxidation number has to add up to the total charge on the ion based on its component atoms. Just as we can confirm the neutrality or charge of a collection of atoms based on their oxidation numbers, we can also determine oxidation numbers based on known charge. So for example, if we were to take uranium hexafluoride, UF6 that is, we know fluorine always has an oxidation number of negative 1 because it's the most electronegative element and it's in group 17. So that means the total charge on the fluorines is negative 6. We also know that this is a neutral molecule, so the total charge has to add up to 0. Now if we have the uranium's charge, minus 6, equals 0, we know that the uranium has to have a charge of positive 6. That is, its oxidation number is 6, so that you can end up with a neutral atom once you've finished. Similarly, you can determine the charge on, or rather the oxidation number on individual atoms in a polyatomic ion, like let's say sulfate, based on its total charge, which in this case is negative 2. Now we know that oxygen, because it's more electronegative, will have its negative oxidation number, which we'll remember is negative 2. So the oxidation total for these four oxygen atoms is the four atoms times negative two. So the total charge, or total oxidation number rather, of negative eight on the oxygen atoms. Now we know this has to add up to a total oxidation state of negative two for the whole polyatomic ion. Now this means that the sulfur minus eight has to be an oxidation state of negative two. In this case, you do a little algebra and you find that the sulfur as an oxidation state of positive 6 in this polyatomic ion. Now there are a few main group elements which have multiple op oxidation states. So for example, sulfur can have the oxidation state positive 6, like we just saw, positive 4, 
or negative 2, which is its oxidation state based on this group number. Now, because it has these two oxidation states here, you can see that sulfur could form sulfur trioxide because of the negative 2 and the positive 6 would make this neutral, or sulfur dioxide, which again with the negative 2 and the positive 4 would make this neutral just based on a changing oxidation state for the sulfur. Now, as I just said, these are called sulfur trioxide and sulfur dioxide. However, you can alter alternately use the stock system similar to how we used it for transition metals to name it using Roman numerals based on its oxidation state. And this eliminates having to think of the confusing bi, tri, tetra, uh, prefix system that can make names of compounds extremely long. So for example, sulfur trioxide would become sulfur and then in parentheses you include the oxidation state, in this case 6 uh, oxide. Or this one down here would become sulfur and then again the oxidation state, in this case for oxide. And this nomenclature makes it simpler to understand exactly what type of sulfur uh, oxidation state you're dealing with within the compound, as well as eliminating the annoying uh, prefixes, which can make compound names long and complicated.